Good morning. Our call to worship this morning is Psalm 46, verses 1 through 3. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way, and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, and the mountain gates quake with their surging. Amen. Heaven came down, and glory filled my soul. Our loving God and Lord welcomes you as he fills this sanctuary with his glory as we worship and praise him this morning. Announcements. I'm going to stand over here because uh, there's a whole bunch of announcements. First of all, thank you to those who attended the Baptist Women Fall Rally yesterday in Chesley. My understanding is the rally was done very, or was very, very good. And uh, those of you who did not go, you missed out on a big, enjoyable day. Um, Tuesdays this month, sewing and crafts at 11 o'clock. Baptism class is at 1 o'clock for those who want to attend that. And that is also uh, a membership class as well, right? Baptism yes, and can membership. Can we say it's 1.30 this week? The meeting is 1.30. It's one thirty this week for baptism and membership. Okay. October 31st, which is Tuesday, um, pack the treat bags for downstairs or downstairs for handing out. Um, so Laurie and Shannon and I don't have to pack them all. Thank you very much. Um, Halloween tracks are at the back of the church. If you want to pick up some tracks to hand out at your place, the same tracks that we're putting in with the package we're handing out here, there are some available at the back. And you can pack, pick them up and hand them out to people or to the kids that come to your door. There's a bereavement group starting on Wednesday, October the 25th. If you would like to join, please contact 519-534-1260, extension 5612. Bake sale and bazaar, November the 18th. So start baking, start bazaaring, so we're going to have a, a good bazaar, right? Yes. Are you baking cookies already? Gotcha. I thought so. The Anglican Lutheran Bazaar is on December the 2nd. Our third, our annual and third quarter meeting is November the 12th. We'll be having a potluck. Reports due to me by November the 1st. That is this week, Wednesday. Christmas collection from other churches is $70 at Foodland. We are collecting toilet paper and canned meat. And it has already started. And the food bank has a list in your bulletins of the things that they are in desperate need of. So we ask you to remember them. Our nomination for this coming year, the same as last year, unless you would like to change it, is so contact Nancy, Dan, Shannon, or myself. There's a list of birthdays in your bulletins, and we're going to sing happy birthday at this time. Dan. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. May the Lord bless and keep you. Happy birthday to you. And many more. <laughs> One announcement that is not up there, and that is that next Sunday we will be having Lord's Supper. And I found this, and I would like to read this to you. Jesus never requires perfection in order to come to him. Because of his saving grace, we don't need to be anxious about taking communion, searching for any potential hidden sin. Fear is never productive. It just gets in the way of love's transforming power. However, when we participate in the body and blood of Christ, we do want to present our hearts in an intentional way. This intentionality not only brings the respect and honor due to sacrament, but it also helps us to create space in our heart for the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, to move and transform us through the communion. When we participate in communion, it is important for there to be a sense of soberness. I don't mean somber, as in gloomy or depressing, 
far from that. It needs to be a sense of gra gravity, gravity about what we are getting to participate in. We have such a good Father who is so incredibly full of grace, but we can never want to lose sight of His holiness or His awesome power. When we participate in the body and blood of Jesus Christ, sober reverence is a healthy and appropriate reaction. Ask the Holy Spirit to prepare your minds and hearts for communion next Sunday. This time it is my privilege to lead you in a prayer of invocation. Almighty God, humbly we come acknowledging and praising your holy name. You are our awesome Lord, our creator, our sustainer, our savior, our guide, our comforter, and so much more. We can only look to you with joy, true happy joy, as we get the opportunity of worshiping in this family of believers. Heaven came down to earth over 2,000 years ago and never left, and that is whom I, whom we, have believed in. Our message today is a question everyone has to answer. It is a personal, soul-searching question we all have to answer. Not a glib answer, for God can see to the very depths of our souls. So an answer that has to be given in true faith and confidence. Let us take a moment now to go to our God in silent, personal prayer. Praise be to you, God, from whom all blessings flow. This morning we seek your face in the message, in the offering, in the songs we sing, and also in our prayers. Get us excited about our relationship with you, so when we leave here we will be singing and praising you, so everyone we meet will be able to see Jesus shining out from our hearts with the powerful presence of the Holy Spirit, because he cannot be contained in us. He is the joy of our hearts and our faces. To you, Lord, we shout our, out our praise, glorifying your holy name, proclaiming our undying love for you and your love and compassion and grace for us. We pray through the incredible power of the Holy Spirit and in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Our first song this morning is number 548, As a Deer Pant for Water. We ask you to stand as you are able.
now. Please be seated. I would like to lead you in a prayer for the offering. Father, we just sang as a deer pant for water. Water is a necessity for our life. You supply us with it. Food is a necessity. You supply us with it. Housing, cars, clothing, etc. are all supply, supplied by your gracious, generous hand. Our offering is a response to your gift to us. What a blessing it is for us to give it to you for the work that you do, but also for the work of our church. Thank you for accepting this gift. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our responsive reading is Psalm 89, verses 8 and 13 through 18. We'd like to lead you in a responsive reading at this time. Who is like you, Lord God Almighty? You, Lord God Almighty, and your faithfulness surrounds you. Your arm is endowed with power. Your right hand is strong. Your right hand is exalted. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Love and faithfulness go before you. Blessed are those who have le learned to acclaim you. Who walk in the light. They rejoice in your name all day long. They celebrate your righteousness. For you are their glory and strength. And by your favor, you exalt our Lord. Indeed, our shield belongs to the Lord. Our King to the Holy One of Israel. Amen. Amen. I uh, want to announce that after the service, we're all invited downstairs. We have a little presentation, so uh, all of you would come downstairs right after the service. I would appreciate it. Our next song is number 510, When Heaven Came Down. We ask you to stand as you're able to sing those three verses. <laughs> Oh, 
invite Pastor Shannon to come forward and lead the rest of the service. this morning, uh, keeping us current, so I appreciate that. Today's seniors moment involves a little clip that Dan found that will, for some of you, will maybe bring back memories, but it's sort of in the flavor of Halloween that is upcoming and uh, wanting to give it a, a, a good perspective. So if we could see that little clip, please. <coughs> for the great pumpkin. And of course, we know where he was kind of going with that. And I think we can all agree that Linus had a solid faith that the great pumpkin was coming. Linus, earlier in that piece, writes to the great pumpkin every year. He's convinced that if he does not falter in his faith, the great pumpkin will come. Linus has spent his Halloweens sitting in a pumpkin patch, waiting for the appearance of this one pumpkin. He could have been trick-or-treating or attending the planned Halloween party, but he chooses to keep the faith and wait in the pumpkin patch. And as Christians, we can take a lesson from Linus about keeping the faith. There are many times when what the world is doing looks much better than what we're doing. As we walk our Christian way, we are often waiting in a proverbial pumpkin patch. The secular world sees us as people who don't know how to have fun. Like Linus, we should always be in the pumpkin patch, keeping our faith as we wait for the Lord's return. What is even more poignant is that Linus is smiling in the pumpkin patch, and he continues to smile even when the great pumpkin doesn't come. If we keep the faith, we keep smiling. Blessings will continue to flow. Others will take notice of the joy in our lives. 
we can be an example that as Christians, our lives are not perfect. We do become disappointed, but we keep the faith waiting for Christ to come again. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that, we thank you for our faith. We thank you for the mercy you have had upon us, the mercy you have shown us. Lord, thank you that we can see through, see the world through vision that is colored and shaped by you. Lord, we thank you for that because it, it reassures us and it gives us hope. Lord, help us to be a people faithful to waiting for you to return, joyful at that expectation, ambassadors of your love. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. <coughs> Does anyone have anything they would like included in today's prayer? Any, anything you're grateful for? Anything that you want to praise God for? Anything you want to ask God? Um, Cindy. I would like to mention that it would be nice if our dog could get dog food from all the people for Christmas. Oh. Or, or a jacket or a hat. Do you know what, in the, um, the food bank, Pet food, dog and cat food uh, are some things listed. So, yeah, you're right. Because pets are important. Anything else? Anybody else? I think we should pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Things are pretty rough over there right now. And we know it's going to happen, but I see it happening that the, the favor is is switching right um, and that we know is going to happen that israel's right to defend itself is questioned and uh, challenged anyway, yes thank you sharon um, at the women's rally yesterday and our speaker i just want to note that her daughter prayed for her mom to get out of prostitution for mm -hmm. eight years. Mm -hmm. And it was such the testimony of how she was born into the prostitution, but also to enlighten us about what really goes on. Mm -hmm. And um, now she's been a Christian for 15 years. And anyway, I think it's important to pray for her. She has yes. a very hard ministry. Yes. Yep. Yes, thank you. I do have her mentioned in, in my prayer today, but thank you for introducing her because um, people that weren't there wouldn't know. Um, yes, her daughter was, she called her daughter a prayer warrior. And um, anyway, she's, uh, too, in, in that vein, I wanted to just mention, too, that something she said, and this is maybe more happens down in the city, but I'm sure there's things online and everything else. But she said one of the ways that they get young girls and boys probably um, into sexual enslavement and into the trade is that they advertise wanting models, right? No experience required. Um, so, you know, if you ever see anything like that, just, just beware. There's so many, and, and what's happening in our schools and <sighs> anyway, thanks for that, Sharon. Let's go to Gothenburg.
O God, whose word is truth and whose love is light, let your truth and light fill this place. What a comfort it is to know that you, Father, are faithful, that you do not change. You alone are truth. You alone are worthy of our worship. Your name is righteousness and justice. You plan for our good and provide for us even though we are weak and anxious, full of doubt and distracted by trivial things. Father, forgive us for all the ways that we fall short of your glory. Forgive us for taking the low road, for making decisions without you, for ignoring your leading and being preoccupied with transitory things. We thank you for the forgiveness of our sins and the new life we receive through faith in Jesus Christ. And we thank you for the sense of purpose and worth we derive from our call to follow Jesus and to continue his work in this world. Father, your word tells us to be thankful in all circumstances. So we thank you for the challenges and hurdles that we face. They provide opportunities for us to seek you, to depend upon you, to learn from you. Even when we fail to fix our eyes upon you and trust, we feel the blessings of your forgiving presence and gentle reminders that you are always with us. We are so grateful, God, for your attention and mercy. We marvel that we matter so much to you. You have created a world that both delights and challenges us. You have established a covenant in which we can thrive with the help of your spirit. You have given us a share in the work that you are doing in the world, and thus given us meaning and purpose beyond that which we can secure for ourselves. Father, in the book of 2 Kings, we read how Elijah asked for a double portion of Elijah's spirit before the elder was taken up in a whirlwind to heaven. Most holy king, we do not pretend to assume that we deserve your mercy, for any righteousness you see in us is because of that given to us through faith in our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, your Son. We recognize our desperate and constant need for you. And that is why we too ask for the blessing of the presence of your spirit. This day we ask for a portion of your grace so that we would be unfeignedly thankful and be able to extend forgiveness to others. We ask for a portion of your wisdom so that we can find your way through this world and guide others as well. We ask for a portion of your peace so that we can conquer our own anxiety and so calm in the communities of which we are a part. We ask for a portion of your courage so that we can confront injustice in ourselves and in our world. We ask for a portion of your persistence so that we won't give up and we won't give in when it comes to reaching out to others in your name. And we ask for a double portion of your hospitality, that we may be ready to invite and welcome others into this fellowship devoted to you. Shield us from the temptation to put off our prayers and postpone our time for reflection. Drive away the fears that make us shrink back from silence. Teach us how to be still and to know you. As only you have the power to answer our prayers, we pray that peace would be restored in Ukraine, in Israel and Gaza, and wherever war has erupted. We pray for comfort and healing for those suffering from the after effects and loss of loved ones after Hurricane Otis. We pray for families who have suffered loss because of the mass shooting in Maine. Wherever there is war and threats of terror, God, let the power of your love mobilize people to meet the needs of those suffering. 
Envelop those peacekeepers and aid workers with protection and courage. Answer the cries of the desperate and the discouraged, the frantic and the frightened, the anxious and those alone. Lord, save those who are struggling with addictions, who are in need, and those who have lost hope. Save them from themselves. Remind them of their worth and purpose. Help us to be your lights of hope. Grant us wisdom as we strive to serve you, Lord God. Lord, we thank you for all who serve our communities, for police and firefighters, for paramedics and nurses and doctors, surgeons and hospital staff. Protect them and renew their strength each day so that they may find encouragement in their work and know your presence. Father, stop those who seek to do evil. Lord, we thank you for prayer warriors. We ask for your protection upon young girls and boys, women and men. Protect them from predators and exploitation. We pray that you would support those like Katerina McLeod and all those who warn and restore others affected by such trauma. Help us to be shrewd and yet innocent as doves, that we may not be fooled by deceivers. Almighty Lord, we ask that you would heal each one of us, heal our relationships, heal our hearts and minds, that they may submit to you and find strength and purpose in you. Heal the spirits and bodies of our families, of our friends in nursing homes and residences who are unable to be with us today. We ask these things on behalf of all those known to us, for Liv and Arlene, for Roger's son-in-law, for those who mourn, for Michelle and Henry, for Sharon and Carlos, for those who hate us, for those struggling in mind, body and spirit, Father, have mercy upon them. Help us to meet the needs of those in this community and help us to be missionary minded for those not close to us. We pray for the peace of all who mourn. Send your spirit, God, to lead them through the valley of the shadow. Fill their minds with positive memories and their hearts with comfort and resurrection hope. Continue to guide and sustain the Susies and all missionaries who are committed to showing the world your way. Bless your believers here and throughout the world. Help us find our voice that we would be obedient to your leading in make, making disciples. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. I have maybe added a little bit to scripture today that what I uh, told Mary Wynn and Bob and Lisa and, and Dan on uh, Thursday. Hear the word of God as taken from the Gospel of Matthew, verses 13 to 19, uh, chapter 16. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. 
Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. May your powerful truth be spoken here, that hearts may cling to you through Jesus we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Young children are notorious for asking questions. Online, some parents have shared questions that their children have asked them. They included this one that reads, my four-year-old asked me if I'd fit in a trunk, and suddenly being put in a nursing home doesn't sound so bad. <laughs> Another parent confessed my four-year-old asked why she couldn't see the moon. I explained the moon's placement in the sky and Earth's rotation. Midway through my impromptu lecture, I heard her softly singing the Finger Family song. I stopped talking, she kept singing. I never answered her questions again. Today my six-year-old asked me if monkeys only eat bananas, and now I'm questioning my entire adult existence because I have absolutely no clue what the answer to this question is. Another writes, my son asked me, where does poo come from? I was a little uncomfortable, but gave him an honest explanation. He looked a little perplexed and stared at me in stunned silence for a few seconds and then asked, and Tiger? You know, Winnie the Pooh and Tiger. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> Last night, my three-year-old asked, does the sun go down here so other people can use it? Then the parent adds, I think she's ready for Harvard. Harvard. One parent wrote, my kid asked what day it is. So I told him Wednesday and he said, I don't agree with that. The parent adds, I didn't know we could do that. One observant child asked, why do I have to eat broccoli when dad doesn't eat his? When there is a litany of why questions, it can certainly test our knowledge and tax our patience. Sometimes we don't have the answers. You don't know why dirt is so dirty, the sky is blue, and why birds don't get electrocuted when they sit on the wires. Or perhaps you do know the answers to those questions. But in today's reading of scripture, there is a question asked that each one of us has to answer. In the, gospel of, in the Gospel of Matthew, of Mark and Luke, we read how Jesus asks, who do people say the Son of Man is? He an the answers he got back were the same flavor as we would get today. Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Now, why would some think Jesus was John the Baptist? Because Herod just had John the Baptist killed. If you look at chapter 14, you will see that when Herod heard about Jesus, he said to his attendants, this is John the Baptist. He has risen from the dead. That is why miraculous powers are at work in him. People in Jesus' time were given to pagan theories. 
that those in authority espoused. The same thing happens today. If a politician or a movie star voices their thanks to karma or lets it be known they are Hindu or talks about reincarnation, people listen. And because people of wealth and fame seem to support these trains of thought, others do too. When Herod got all wide-eyed supposing that Jesus was John the Baptist, he was talking about what is called metempsychosis. It is known as transmigration or reincarnation. And I wish that we could say our world had grown out of this philosophy. But many in Jesus' day believed that the human soul could be reborn into other people, animals, or planets. This idea still exists within Hinduism. People today still talk about karma, which in, which in Hinduism and Buddhism is the sum of a person's actions in this and supposedly previous states of existence, which decides their fate in future existences. What it does is that it sucks the hope out of living because you're living with curses from the past in an endless cycle. It is based on Greek philosophers like Pythagoras and Plato and upheld by the Gnostics and Stoic religions of Christ's time. With reincarnations, there is no divine mercy or forgiveness available. It denies the existence of a sovereign personal God and defies the commandment we are to have no other gods before us. And it defies the words from Hebrews that tells us man is destined to die once and after that to face judgment. So when Jesus' disciples say that popular belief guesses that he is, the son, it is John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets, that's what they are thinking, reincarnation. Islamists today see Jesus only as a prophet. The Jews of Jesus' time were also expecting to see Elijah before their Messiah arrived, and they presumed their Messiah would be one of a political nature. Jesus' activity, possibly his warnings of coming judgment, had caused some to identify him with Elijah. So just as the scene we read about in Matthew is much like our own today, where there is confusion, misinformation, and false teaching, Jesus asks a second question. As we read this passage and understand what the prevailing thought of the time was about Christ, Jesus turns to his disciples just as he turns to each one of us and asks, but what about you? Who do you say I am? Each one of us has to answer this question before we leave this earth. What about you and me? Who do we say that Jesus is? Today, right now, who do you say that Jesus is? Because unless you accept the fact that you are a sinner, believe that Jesus sacrificed himself for you and me, and ask him to be your savior, the keys of the kingdom of heaven will elude your grasp. That's the quadrillion infinite dollar question each one of us has to come to grips with. Who do you say that Jesus is? For more than two years, Jesus had been mentoring his apostles, 
After weeks of concentrated instruction, this essentially constituted their final exam. Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. There is the key to salvation. We must be in Christ before we are gifted that first precious key. The prayer of salvation follows the promise from Romans saying, if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That is just what Peter did. As spokesman for the group, he proclaimed that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And what did Jesus say? Jesus called him blessed. For that truth was revealed to him, not by flesh and blood, but by Jesus' Father in heaven. Each one of us who is in Christ, who declares and believes in him as Savior, will be blessed. We are blessed. Because that message of salvation has been revealed to us by our Heavenly Father. When we begin to understand his love, when we begin to understand the peace we have through forgiveness and the promise of eternal presence with God the Almighty, when we begin to understand the hope that dawns every new day and every new year when we journey with Jesus, when we begin to understand the joy that only Christ can bring into our lives, we have the power and authority and responsibility to share that, to open the door of heaven for others with those keys of the kingdom of heaven. When we have the key of salvation, we are in Christ. We are new. We are part of the body of Christ. And I want to remind you as believers that you are justified and redeemed vessels of God. You are the workmanship of God. You are accepted, you are secure, and you are significant. As a member of his body, you are a sanctified saint, yet a child that needs to feed on his word and grow in love and knowledge of our risen Redeemer. I don't know if you have frequented many yard sales this past summer. But there's always someone looking for a hidden treasure in the mix of articles. A piece of glass or porcelain suddenly becomes valuable crystal or collectible if it has a famous maker's mark on it. As disciples of Jesus, we bear our most masterful maker's mark upon us. He sets his seal of ownership on us. In his humbling mercy, he put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. And what is to come is eternally more than we can imagine. And it is all because he has revealed himself to us through Jesus, his son. Did you notice what Jesus did when Peter professed his faith in Christ? Jesus called him by name and lineage. 
Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, and I tell you that you are Peter. Peter is a child of Christ. He is accepted, justified, and belongs to God. This is the same Peter who will publicly deny Jesus three times. Knowing that, knowing what is to come, Jesus calls Peter blessed. When I first read that, it made me think of Jesus' promise. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. Jesus claims us before the throne of God. Like the prodigal son who returns home after spending his time and money shamefully, does the father turn him away? No, he claims him as his son and blesses him. So too, when we stand before our Heavenly Father after squandering what we have been given and who we are, He forgives us, He justifies us, and He empowers us. When men, women, and children accept Christ, when you and I accept Christ, we are or should be awakened to a sense of our own worth and of the possibilities that lie before us. Sadly, sometimes this is a slow process for some of us. Sometimes we just need a reminder. For you as for Peter, the Lord of hosts will mark out the proper work for each of us. He will give you and I a place as a living stone in his church that the gates of Hades will not overcome. Jesus will impart to you and me every quality we need in the difficult and joyful circumstances of life that lie before us. When we read in Revelation that the wall of the holy city Jerusalem had 12 foundations and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb, we get a glimpse into how the Creator cherishes His faithful. How He has planned for our preservation. We are secure in His love. We are free from condemnation. We cannot be separated from the Father. He considers us important enough to finish the good work that he started in us. How great is his love for us. For many and sundry reasons, as you can well imagine, I was not a cheerleader in high school. But today, I want to be your cheerleader. To help you as much as my knowledge is limited, to help you understand who Jesus is. Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, of the living God, who died once for all for the redemption of all. Repentance before him and faith in him as your risen Redeemer brings salvation and the promise of eternal life to you. And this is not head knowledge. This is a submission of the heart to Jesus, the cornerstone, the rock upon which the church is built. And we are appointed to bear fruit. We might not feel like it. We might not think we're worthy. We might not think we're capable. But God considers us fit and able and qualified to bear fruit for him. And we can work to that end fully assured that the gates of Hades will not overcome it. 
I want also to remind us today that when we are in Christ, when we are saved and have that key of salvation, that we share with others to help them open up the treasures of heaven, we can fight against being worried and insecure and depressed and discouraged. We can have life and have it to the full without being bogged down and burdened by our insecurities and by second-guessing God's plans for us. It makes me think of some of the candles we use as decorations around our house at Christmas time. Last year when we opened up the boxes and I'm forever hearing from Dan how there are too many boxes of Christmas decorations. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm working on that. <laughs> but when we opened up those boxes, some of the battery operated candles <coughs> needed new batteries. There was no flicker left in them. Some of the batteries were even leaking. At some time or other, we all feel that way. We feel drained. We need a jump start, a battery boost to restore our flicker. That's what the Bible provides. And I hope in some small way today's reading reveals that when we know who Jesus is, when we are reminded of just how much you are accepted and loved by God, that he holds you tightly and securely because you are so important, you are so significant to him, I hope you will be encouraged and empowered to open the door of heaven for others. And it is on this truth, the confession that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, that Jesus builds his church. Jesus is the cornerstone, the rock upon which the church is built. And it is on that profession of faith that Peter made and millions after him have made that you also, like living stones, you and I are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus. And that has got to awaken us to a sense of our worth to God and of the possibilities that he has set before us. We are the living stones being built into his church. And yes, like the exterior of any building, we take a beating. Our congregations are diminishing. Churches are closing. And we certainly feel like the odd one out when it comes to definitions of who God is, what his word says, and how it should impact our lives. On Monday and Tuesday of this week, thanks to you, I was able to attend a preaching conference in Toronto. And you can't assume, uh, there were, there were um, ministers and leaders there from all Protestant denominations. But I was at one point in conversation with a uh, a Baptist minister from Nova Scotia. And we got talking about a hot button issue. And I found myself defending what the Bible said. We take a beating. 
but we cannot, must not, and should not lose heart. For Jesus says he will build his church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Jesus says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Binding and loosing is very much legal Jewish talk for prohibiting and for permitting, for determining what was wrong and must not be done and what was right and ought to be done. We are authorized to make those practical applications of truth to the conditions and needs of the hour by which the moral life and tone of people will be raised and purified. Jesus did not tell his disciples how to organize believers how often we should have communion, but that we should have communion. But following the spirit of the new covenant, Christ gives us the keys of heaven. The keys of heaven were given to Jew and Gentile alike that all may know the saving that Christ offers. For we know that our master and mediator wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. I don't know if it is the origins of being a chip off the old block or not, but from the book of Isaiah and 1 Samuel, we read, Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness and who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn, which you were cut, and to the quarry from which you were hewn. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. It is faith and God through Christ with the gift of the Holy Spirit that Jesus builds his church that the gates of Hades will not overcome. Nothing, no thing will overpower or destroy the church of Christ. Jesus issues that decree with all power and all authority, and for those of us who are believers, we are a part of that. As Christians, we have the keys from God to live with power and to live with authority. Sanctified by God, secure in Him, understanding we are significant to him. We have the keys from God to live with power and authority in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And with their guidance and leading, to open the kingdom of heaven up to others so that they would believe. Lord, help us to be obedient and grant us growth. Let us pray. God Almighty, we praise you for revealing yourself to us through your Son, our Savior. We thank you heartily for the blessing and presence of the Holy Spirit within us when we accept Jesus as our Savior. Lord, if there is anyone here this morning that has not claimed you as their Savior, who does not know what it means to be forgiven of all that is past, Lord, we pray that you would reveal yourself to them and they would believe in their hearts and proclaim with their mouths that Jesus, you are Lord. Father, we take comfort in knowing that when we turn to you, you accept us. We know that we are secure in your love and that we are significant to you. We claim this recognizing how mercifully you have dealt with us in the past. And we, we, we remember your grace in order 
that we would live with power and authority so that we might glorify you by bearing fruit in your name. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Please stand as you are able to sing our final hymn, I Know Whom I Have Believed.